In this tutorial we'll talk about buffers in modern OpenGL, a crucial concept for transferring information from the CPU to the GPU. I'll show you how to organize data using vertex buffers and arrays and reuse it with element buffer objects. To make things interesting, we'll build a 3D chart starting from a simple flat grid of points, adding the Z component and rotations, and finally joining the points with lines using the element buffer. So make sure you like and subscribe and let's begin. Alright, let's start by rendering a simple grid of points. In OpenGL the normalized coordinates range from minus 1 to 1, with the zero point in the screen's center. To represent the coordinates of all the points, we will use a flat array, where the first three elements describe the first point, the following three the second point, and so on. We will keep the z value at zero for now, this will change when we introduce the actual surface function. We construct this array in the surface class, iterating over the requested number of vertices per side in the vertical and horizontal dimensions. To ensure the vertices are distributed evenly between the coordinates, ranging from minus 1 to 1, we need to calculate the vertex step correctly. Let's say we want to distribute n vertices along a line starting at minus 1 and ending at 1. If the first point is at the beginning of the line and the last one at the end, it means we have n minus 1 segments between the points. Now we need to divide the total line length by the number of segments to get the distance between the two vertices. And that's the value of our vertex step constant, which we add to x and y for every column and row, ending up with a nice even grid. Now we need to transfer this data to the GPU memory so that OpenGL can access it. As you can see, the main.cpp file contains a lot of code related to setting up OpenGL, Glue and WX widgets. We won't discuss that part in this tutorial. If you want to know how this works, check out my OpenGL and WX widgets setup video. We won't go into much detail on shaders either. That's for some future tutorial. Instead, we'll focus on these few lines that set up the OpenGL buffers. That's where we transfer the data to the GPU, describe the data structure, and bind to the correct OpenGL targets used by the drawing functions. Let's step back and try to understand what's going on here. In the OpenGL Canvas class, we have three interesting variables. The first one is obviously the surface object we discussed before, which contains the array of vertex positions to draw. The following two are these cryptic integers, VAO and VBO. These will store names for OpenGL objects we need to generate. Let me explain. You can think of OpenGL as a state machine. Some OpenGL calls set a state, while others read it to, for example, draw something on the screen. Some states in OpenGL are encapsulated using objects. Every object has a type a buffer object, a vertex array object, a texture object, and so on. Objects also have a name, which, weirdly enough, is an integer. That's why we need our VAO and VBO variables, to store our object names. We generate an object using the glgen call. Here we create a vertex array object and store its name, remember a name is an integer in OpenGL, in the VAO variable. Next, we ask OpenGL to create a vertex buffer, and again we save its name. The first parameter of the gen calls is the number of objects to generate. The second is the address of a variable to store the object's name, or an array if we want more than one object. Next, we bind our objects to targets. You can think of targets as slots that can be filled in by our code and used by the rendering pipeline. For example, the glDrawArrays call will check which vertex array object is currently bound and use the data it describes to draw stuff on the screen. Our OpenGL objects are empty, so let's fill them with values. The next call, glBufferData, copies our XYZ array to the GPU memory. The first parameter is the OpenGL target. At this point, the glArrayBuffer target is associated with our VBO object, so that object will be affected by the glBufferData call. Next, we have the total size of the buffer in bytes, the address of the first element, and the hint for OpenGL for optimizing the storage. Here we use the GL static draw constant, meaning we intend to set the data once and use it many times for drawing. Remember that this is just an optimization hint. OpenGL won't prevent multiple updates to the buffer if we choose to do so. 
So our VBO is prepared and now it's time to set up the vertex array. This is where things get interesting. The vertex array object does not store any vertex data directly. Instead, it contains information on how to retrieve vertex data for a given vertex attribute. Remember our vertex shader program? It expects a vertex attribute at location 0. An attribute describes some aspect of a vertex. It can be a position, color, a normal vector, or anything else you want to associate with a vertex and then use it in the shader. In our case, the shader expects a vertex position. That's what we set up with the GL vertex attribute pointer call. The first argument is the location described in the shader. Next comes the size, indicating how many elements in the buffer are used to describe a single vertex attribute. We need three buffer elements to represent a position. Each one is of type float. GL false indicates we do not want normalization. Then comes the stride telling OpenGL where the next element of this vertex attribute starts. At first glance, this looks weird. We already stated that a single attribute is composed of three floats, so why do we need to repeat the same thing? Well, we can have multiple attributes in the same buffer. For example, we could interleave the position and color. Assuming the shader expects attribute 0 to be the XYZ position and attribute 1 to be the RGB color, we can organize our buffer like this. The first three elements describe the first vertex position, the following three describe its color, and then we start the next vertex. In this case, the position attribute consists of three floats, but its stride is now six floats, as we need to move by six elements to get to the next point's position. That's also the case for the color attribute, the only difference being the start position of that attribute, which is three floats. Alright, let's get back to our grid example. We have described the vertex attribute at location 0. Now a very interesting thing happens when we call GL vertex attribute pointer. OpenGL checks if an object is bound to the vertex array target. If so, the vertex attribute pointer descriptor is stored in that vertex array. Note that we don't specify our buffer name anywhere in the GL vertex attribute pointer call. The framework checks which buffer is currently bound to the GL array buffer target and assumes the vertex attribute uses that buffer. This information is also stored in the vertex array object. This is just how OpenGL works. Some functions update the OpenGL states, like which buffers are bound to which targets, and others use that state in sometimes confusing ways. In our case, the GL bind vertex array call updates the vertex array target and the GL bind buffer updates the GL array buffer target. Then GL vertex attribute pointer checks what these targets are set to and updates the vertex array using data both contained in the targets and specified in the function call arguments. The last step needed to set up the vertex array is to enable the pointer at a given location as it's disabled by default. At this point, we can unbind the buffer. We won't need the GL array buffer target for drawing, as all the required data is in the vertex array. Note that unbinding the target does not delete the object. It simply resets the target. We could even unbind the vertex array, but in that case we would have to bind it again before drawing. In our code, we decided to leave the vertex array bound. Because of this, we don't have to rebind it in onPaint, where we call GL draw arrays. This method checks the current vertex array target and draws its elements using the mode passed in the first parameter. The following parameters specify the static index and the number of indices to be rendered. To get the total indices count, we divide our XYZ array size by 3, because that array has the same number of elements as our vertex buffer. The GL draw arrays call is concerned with vertex attributes though, and our vertex attribute consists of three floats or three buffer elements. Alright, we have a two-dimensional grid of points. Let's change the z-values by introducing a surface function. Here's a simple 3D function describing a sombrero-like shape. We scale the x and y values by some constant so that we can keep them in OpenGL minus 1 to plus 1 range and still get results that look interesting. We add the function pointer to our surface class constructor and use it to calculate the z-value of our vertices. After running the app, we can see that nothing has changed. 
we still see a flat 2D grid. Actually, the grid is not flat. Every Z value is different. We don't see it because the Z axis is perpendicular to the screen plane. To see our surface in 3D, we need to rotate it. The rotations in 3D are a bit more complex than in 2D, so I'll leave that for a future tutorial. For now, we will use simple matrices to rotate our chart around two axes. To do that, we need to use some math library. We will opt for GLM, a popular choice for OpenGL applications. Like with WX widgets and Glue, we will use external project to download GLM automatically. Be sure to check out my WX widgets and CMake tutorial if you want to know how this works. Because GLM is a header-only library, we set the configure and build steps to empty commands and copy the downloaded files to the include directory during the install step. In the main file, we include the GLM headers, add the onKeyDown method to let the user rotate the chart, and declare the member variables to hold the angle values. We bind the key event in the canvas constructor and implement it below. The code is simple. We change the angle variables when the user hits the arrow keys. We need to use these angles to rotate the chart. First, we add a uniform in the vertex shader, remembering to multiply the position by that matrix. Then, in onPaint method, we construct the matrix by combining rotations around the X and the Z axis and set the shaders uniform to our matrix. And that's all we need to see that our chart is indeed a 3D surface. Alright, let's turn our dots into lines. One way to do it would be to replace the GL points in the draw call with GL lines. The problem is that GL lines draws the lines from the first element to the second, then from third to fourth and so on, resulting in gaps between segments. We can solve this problem without changing our vertex buffer, by adding another layer of indirection, an element buffer. Element buffers hold indices of a vertex array instead of entire vertex attributes. To draw line segments between the vertices 0, 1 and 3 using GL lines, we need to store index 0, then index 1, and then again index 1 and index 2. Let's build the element buffer to join our points with the horizontal lines first. We add a vector of indices to the surface class. The first question we need to answer is how big that array needs to be. We need as many horizontal lines as there are lines in the grid. That part is obvious. Then we duplicate every index for each row except the first and the last ones. Or equivalently, we need to iterate over every column except the last one, and for each column, add that index and the one from the next column. We resize the vector and add the vertex indices in the loop. If you don't understand this algorithm, I recommend taking a pen and a piece of paper and figuring out how this works for different vertex counts per side. Remember too that we are talking about the indices of the vertex array, not the vertex buffer. And the vertex array item is built from three vertex buffer elements. Let's draw the lines. First, we add the EBO variable to hold the element buffer object name generated by OpenGL. In the setup method, we generate the object bind it to the GL element array buffer target and specify the buffer data format. Now in onPaint, we change the drawing call from GL draw arrays to GL draw elements. The crucial thing to understand here is that GL draw elements still uses the currently bound vertex array to draw, and the vertex array remembers the bind calls to GL element array buffer. Consider this. If we unbind the element buffer while VAO is bound, no element buffer will be stored in the vertex array and the call to GL draw elements will draw nothing. However, if we first unbind the VAO and then unbind the element buffer, that unbind operation won't affect the vertex array. If we now rebind the array just before drawing, our element buffer will be used. If you understand this relationship between vertex arrays, vertex buffers and element buffers, 
you are on the right track to mastering modern OpenGL. I encourage you to try binding and unbinding the buffers at different places in the code and predicting the outcome. Check the Kronos Wiki articles linked in the description of this video if you need more clarification. Let's add the vertical lines. We extend the size of the array and add the indices in a similar manner to what we did with the horizontal lines. Now our chart looks like a proper surface chart. And that's it for this tutorial. Thanks for watching.